So the last thing which I'm going to discuss in relation to the strains is going to be the strain gauges. Now, usually you cannot measure the stress. So what you can measure is the strain. So the strain is related to the displacement, so you can possibly measure that. Now, how to measure the strain? Usually you have strain gauges, and these would come probably in a form of a rosette, like this one. And this can be fixed to the surface of the object where you want to measure the strains. Now, these are electric, electrical resistance. That these micro devices with electrical resistance, once you deform them, the resistance will change, and you can tell from the change of the resistance the amount of the strain that's undergoing these, these rosettes. Okay, and you can use them in different applications. So, this is a biological application, biomechanics, where you want to understand the biomechanical properties of bones, for example. And it is really useful for situations where you have really complex geometries, just, just like in here, because then it is going to be really important to understand how the stress is going to distribute within, within this not, not quite conventional shapes. And this is very far from what we have been working on in mechanical structure engineering. You always have standard shapes like cylinders, boxes, or, or this, this, uh, this type of standard geometries. Once you get into Biomechanics, all the geometries are going to be non-conventional, so it's going to be really challenging to, to work on that. So this is one very useful application for strain gauges. Now, you fix the strain gauge to the surface, so you can measure the strain on the surface. Because this is measuring the strain on the surface, it's going to result into some strain tensor that is going to look like this. E11, E12, and zero, E21, E22, and zero. And then in the third direction, you only have zeros. So the strain, so the strain tensor on the surface is going to look exactly like this. And then you measure that in a specific direction. So you measure the strain in a specific direction. Assume that you measure well, the measurement you have is going to be probably E1, then you just need to link this E1 to this strain tensor. So to do that, you can write this or project this strain tensor in a specific coordinate system, x1 and x2. And then you know that this strain gauge is probably, is probably located in this specific direction. You know the angle of this direction. So let us assume that this is the angle alpha. So you can find the normal direction for the strain gauge, and the normal direction n is going to be cos alpha and sine alpha and zero in the third direction, because the third or the first components need to be the components in this direction, in the x1 direction. So this is the cosine of the alpha, and the second component is the this component in the x2 direction, so it should be the sine of alpha. Now, you have the normal direction. You multiply it from left and right with a strain tensor, and this should equal to E1. Now, the strain gauges would come, as I said, in these rosettes. So you have always three, three gauges hooked together. So you will have from each rosette, you will have three measurements. And these three measurements would be enough to identify E11, E12, and E22. You have three unknowns, you have three measurements. So three unknowns and three measurements should be possible to solve and you get the value of the strain tensor. So you'd be able to identify the exact strain tensor on the surface of your object, the object you're trying to, to measure. All right, so I'm going to show you one example. So you have a strain, a strain rosette or a strain gauge rosette placed on a surface. The surface is in the x1, x2 plane, and the first gauge is at 30 degrees with the x1. The second gauge is at 90 degrees with x1. And the third gauge is at 150 degrees 
with X. So I know the direction for, for these three gauges. And I know the measurements are going to be E1, E2, and E3. So I want to link these values to the strain tensor so that I can find the strain tensor. I'm just going to do this in one note so you can see it there. And probably start by drawing the, the gauges. This is x1, this is x2. The first one is located at 30 degrees. The second is located at 90 degrees. And the third is located at 150 degrees. So starting from the first one, this one here, see the direction, the normal direction for that is going to be cosine 30, sine 30, and 0. This is N1. N2 is going to be cosine 90, sine 90, and 0. And then you have N3 is going to be cosine 150, sine 150, and 0. So cosine 30, I think this should be square root of 3 divided by 2, right? Correct? OK. So this is square root of 3 divided by 2. And then the sine would be half. And I have 0 in there. I can simply just try this as half square root of 3. Oops. square root of 3, and then I have 1, I have 0, and then cosine 90 is 0, sine 90 is 1, and I have 0, 0, and then I have this, I think this should be minus, right, minus square root of 3, minus square root of 3, and then this should be half, and this should be 0. All right, so I have N1, N2, and N3. Supposedly, I have the measurements E1, E2, and E3. I can link them to the strain tensor in the X1, X2 plane. So this is going to be E11, E12, 0, E21, E22, and 0, and then 0, 0, 0 for the rest of it. So the first, our four. For my first measurement, I'm going to take N1. So this is the strain tensor multiplied by N1 from left and N1 from the right. So it is half here half here, I have the square root of 3, and then 1, 0, square root of 3, 1, 0, and this should be equal to E1, so the measurements I have from the first strain gauge. So this is E11 one, one multiplied by, I keep the half outside, square root of 3, E11, one, one, add it to E21, and then I have square root of 3, E12, add it to E22, two, two, and then I have 0. This will need to be multiplied with this one again. So I have half multiplied by half. This is 1 over 4. Square root of 3 multiplied by square root of 3. This is going to be 3 e 1, 1 plus square root of 3, E, 1, 2. Oh, it's 2, 1, sorry. And then I have this added to, I shouldn't have been, I should have been using a, all right, so 
This is the first entry, this one multiplied by this one, and then I add that to one multiplied by this. So this is square root of three multiplied by E one, two, and then add it to E two, two. And finally, I have zero multiplied by zero, which is not going to add any, anything to that. So I have E one to be equal to one over four multiplied by three E one of three E one one, add it to this one and this one, they are equal. So I can just add two square root of three. I can choose either one, two or two, one, it would not make any difference. And then I have added to E two, two. So I've got my first equation. The second equation, I probably just put it inside the box. So I know that this is my first equation. And the second equation, I do the same for E2. So this one is multiplied by 0, 1, 0. And so it is 0, 1, 0 from left and right. And this would be equal to E2. So in this case, I have E2. One and then e to two and then zero. This is multiplied by this vector. This one will cancel this one. This one will give me e two two and this one is equal to zero. So this will result into e two two and then I have e two two is equal to e two. So the measurements I'm going to have from the second gauge is immediately going to give me the normal components in the two direction. Okay, so this is already one of my unknowns. And then the last equation, I can get the E3 from. So this is one over two square root of three negative. Was it negative? Yeah. So this is one, and then this is zero. And then I have half here, minus square root of three, one, and zero. So from the first multiplication I get, half outside and minus square root of three e one one added to e two one and then i have minus square root of three e one two added to e two two and then i have zero now i need to multiply i just use the one over four outside so this half multiplied by this half and then I have minus square root of three multiplied by these guys here. So this would be then minus square root of three multiplied by minus square root of three. This is going to be plus three e one one. And then I have minus square root of three multiplied by e two one. Then I'm going to add to that this entire thing. So it is minus square root of three multiplied by e one two, added to e two two. So this will give me one over four. As I said, this one and this one are pretty much the same. So I have three e one one minus two square root of three e one two, added to e two two. And this would be my third equation. So this is the measurement I have from the third strain gauge and the third equation. Oops. So if you use these three equations, this is one, 
this is two, and this is a three. So if you use these three equations, you can find the three unknowns, which are E11, E12, and E22. And usually you would do that in multiple places, and then you can use the compatibility conditions to evaluate the displacement field or evaluate this strain across the entire object. Usually the strain will behave like a function, it will not behave just like numbers, so you have a function describing the strain across the entire material object or the, the object you are interested in. Here, so this is 